Okay, welcome back. I hope you already watched Financial Statements Part 1, so we're continuing on financial accounting. And the second part of the financial statements just to get a better understanding. And right after this one, the third part, we'll be covering the cash flow statement all in one encapsulated area. So here, I just made up the company Pete's Garage, predominantly because I was happened to be thinking about the place. It's actually in Monroe, Michigan. So you have the name of a company. I'm just using Pete's Garage. And then you have income statement for the year ended December 31st, 2017. That's what we call the heading or the label of the financial statement being the income statement. You start with the company name, you name the statement itself, which one it is, whether it's the income statement, statement of retained earnings, balance sheet, or statement of cash flow. You put the name there. Then this is the part that most people mess up on. Every financial statement except for the balance sheet is pretty much a, like a video like you're watching right now. What happened from January 1, for instance, through to the end of the year. So it's a coverage of time, it's a flow, it's a movie. The balance sheet is a snapshot, taking a picture. It's a one moment in time. That's why you either just see where it says December 31st, say 2017, or at, meaning at this moment. Not the day before, not the day after, not the whole year, just right now this is what my net worth is or what our balance sheet is. So, the most important thing is getting the date right because if you don't say that, then you're not implying a passage of time. So again, the only thing is I did it very simplistic, which is still true, revenue minus expense gives you net income. However, account, accountants can't make it that simple, otherwise why would we need to get paid so well? We actually have a bunch more breakdown, because those are just simple summary categories. Sales revenue, still the same thing. You might give a sales discount. And if you give a discount, which I'm sure you've gotten discount before sales on items, when you net that, you get a slightly less because there's a discount. So you could say sales net, or sales revenue net or net sales revenue. Then I put minus COGS. The reason for the initials is it's a lot of writing and I tried to fit it in. That stands for cost of goods sold. The example of that would be you, let's say you, that you are a merchandiser, you buy a dress, you own a, you own a lady's clothing store, you buy a dress for say $30 and you're selling it for $50. The cost of the dress, keeping it simplistic, just the cost of acquiring it, is $30. Now we realize that there also probably is some utilities involved and so forth, but in rent, but we're just keeping it simple. So that'd be cost of goods sold. Net sales minus cost of goods sold gives you gross profit. Okay? Gross profit is just saying this is before we take other items into account and other items could end up being operating expenses. That would be along the lines that you might think of as like the accountant, for instance, or attorney, or say you have these retail stores, but you have a different place, it's just the headquarters. You sell nothing there, you cover all the business transactions. That would be what you consider like operating expense. There's also some things that might be like non-operating, and you could end up having just different items you could have sold something, gain on sale of equipment, or you get rid of a market segment. So what we're saying, there's different things that come into play that could come in right there, and I'll address another later. So there's a couple weird items that could occur, but it doesn't occur every time, so I just put a few dots, just saying there could be something else there. And you'll see that as you go through later on and do more accounting, some items happen. Then you subtract taxes because give unto Caesar what is Caesar's. The government wants their taxes. I will tell you this. The taxes that we do on the income statement, there's rules we have to follow. Those taxes, that exact number there, does not have to be the same number that's on the person's tax return. Is an individual be a 1040? Businesses commonly do a 1041. Pretty much the same idea. But there can be slightly different rules that apply because... Accountants don't change the rules in terms of computing taxes and policies as much as our good old politicians do and how they continually play games, especially at election time. 
So we try and keep it standardized so it's not flip-flopping all the time. And then that gives you income from operations. That, that is from normal operations. You could also have plus or minus something from discontinued operations. You get rid of a market segment I was mentioning. You sell off a division. You say you're not going to end up keeping this uh, and sell, say, west of the Mississippi. You're getting rid of everything there. That would be discontinued operations. Then you get net income. So it just means it can be more convoluted, but it's just how you break it down. And the logical reason why you want to break it down and make it effectively harder is your income from operations, that's what should be replicated every year so you can compare one year to the next, whereas some of these weird items you want to pull out so you can say, okay, this is what you did, and if we take away those weird things, here's what you really did that we could expect you to do next year or hope that you do, or hope you do even better. But it's giving you a playing field to look at without the idea is if you go into the woods and you have a ton of trees, it's a lot easier if you climb the tallest one then you look and see where you are. That's what this is kind of doing. Then, the other part I want to point out, oh, actually let me stay here. The other thing I want to point out is every financial statement I've like pointed out reminding you that they're for year ended, or during the year, or during the period, meaning you're intentionally stating a period of time and the date in the heading of the financial statement. The one exception is balance sheet. And yes, I could have done statement retained earnings, which you normally would again before you do the balance sheet, but I just want to hit those two main ones because there's not a lot to statement retained earnings. We pretty much covered it last time. If you had, of course, like a gain on sale, uh, disposal of a market segment, all that, that potentially could go in, but we're keeping it very basic. And it normally is. So you have the balance sheet, Pete's Garage Company name, balance sheet at, or just simply put December 31st, 2017, the date, at the end of the period, or the end of the year. Now I do want to point out the end of the year does not have to be December 31st, it normally is, but you could have a year end, like a lot of universities have a year end of June 30th. And there's different reasons for that because a lot of states and the revenues and all that have June 30th. But you can pick any year end, relatively speaking. But most pick December 31st as the calendar year. But either way, it's a 12-month period. And you can, of course, do financial statements like every six months or every quarter, which would be every three months because there's four quarters in a year, so 12 divided by four is three. Another big mistake people make is forgetting that. A quarter is not four months, it's three months. And you can do a monthly, you can technically do them weekly or daily if you wanted. But that's your financial statement. Again, though the new part is with accounting, we start off with current assets. We break down current assets and long-term assets. Current liabilities and long-term liabilities. And then I broke out pretty much everything you ever see in the equity section because there's a ton of things you can imagine that are different assets and liabilities. And I'll give you an idea why I say that in a second. But the equity section is common stock if you have shareholders instead of just simple partners or owners. You have common stock in the thing called PIC paid in capital, excess of par, if there's par value, and that's for a later date. But I just want you to get used to seeing every possible thing that's under equity because it can always change, but that's all there is. Then you have preferred stock, we'll talk about that at a different time, and paid in capital, excess of par for preferred. Treasury stock is of another potential, paid in capital, excess of par for treasury. And then retained earnings. That retained earnings, remember from the lot prior one, is where you get the statement of retained earnings. That ending retained earning number is the number that goes right here. So once you get net income, we, the statement of retained earnings, you'd have said Pete's Garage, statement of retained earnings for the year ended or for the period ending December 31st, 2017. Retained earnings beginning, which would end up being January 1, 2017 retained earnings, which will be the exact same number as December 31st, 2016, because I always like to say what happens between December 31st, 2016 and January 1st, 2017, people end up celebrating a ball drop and have a drink and kiss hopefully the right person. So you have beginning retained earnings, add or subtract net income, subtract if it's a loss, subtract dividends, gives you ending retained earnings, that's the number that we're talking about at the very bottom, the last number on the balance sheet before you get a total in the equity section. So let's go back to say why do you have current assets, long-term assets, 
current liabilities and long-term liabilities. We can make it trickier. Sometimes they don't say long-term assets. They'll say non-current assets. Instead of long-term liabilities, they say non-current liabilities. Same thing. Just different ways of wording it. So a current asset, we say it's in, in terms of liquidity. The very most liquid asset you have is cash. So that would be the very first listed under assets on a balance sheet. Then you could have what's called an account receivable. An account receivable would be like a credit card that you have with the company and they have the right to receive it. They sold to you on their credit that they extended to you. So you have a name on an account with them. So that's your account that they will be receiving in the future account receivable. And there's different items along that line. That long term is normally what I call PP&E, property, plant, and equipment, which would be land, building, and equipment. Long term things. You can also have a long term uh, note or bond receivable, meaning you gave someone cash and they agreed to pay you. That's kind of like a CD at a bank. The bank has a CD, they receive it, so it's a receivable to them. And if it's a CD that's a couple years, a note, that kind of idea, depending on which. Remember, the big thing in accounting, I should point that out right there, is make sure who are you representing. You would know if you're doing your own business, but in school, and they give you the fact pattern, you got to know if you're, say, the bank or if you're the customer. If the bank lends to you, they have the receivable, you have the payable. But if you're the person, you receive the money, so you have the rec you receive the cash, and you have a payable. You have a payable to the bank, so you have to know who you're talking about that you're doing the accounting work for. Same thing for current liabilities. There would be we're talking about the account receivable. There could also be an account payable where you owe someone on credit, so that's your payable. You owe them. You have to pay them in the future. Payable means in the future, in terms of the tense of the word. And there's like. Say you have a car payment, same thing. Well, the current year portion of the car payment would be current liability, and the long year portion, assuming you owe more than a year, would be a long term liability or non current portion of the debt. So that's pretty much what we're talking about with balance sheet, income statement, statement, retained earnings. The next one will be the statement of cash flow. I like to do that all on its own. Thank you.